comedy used to be healing. I mean, that's what Lenny Bruce was about. Lenny really made you think about things. People always could talk about Pryor and Carlin. Many well, people don't were, know Lenny was... Right. They were great, but the, the reason they were had the opportunity to be great because he yeah. paved the way. So, yeah, he yeah. certainly did. Well, that was a clip from the Los Angeles Times. Critics' Choice, I'm Not a Comedian, I'm Lenny Bruce, which is a look at the life and battles of the most groundbreaking and impactful comedian of all time, Lenny Bruce. It draws from his many court battles, champion the freedom of speech, and is woven together by the show's creator and star, Ronnie Marmo, and expertly directed by Tony Award-winning stage, actor, film, and television star, Joe Montagna. The one-man play is coming to the Straz on the 21st, but before taking to the Straz, we are glad that Ronnie is joining us here on the show. Good morning. Thank How you. Are you. I'm great. What an introduction. I think I should just go because you can't do better than <laughs> that. That was fantastic. Just do a wave. Well, you Thank know, you. We're, we're excited you're here and to talk about this because there's so many different levels I want to chat with you about. And first, I think the obvious, Lenny Bruce, why was that someone that you identified with that you wanted to be involved in creating this and now, of course, starring in it? You know, about 15 years ago, a guy named Sam Bobrick wrote this play called Lenny's Back and Boy Is He Pissed. That was the name of the show. And it was about Lenny Bruce. And, and I'm too young. I, I wasn't around when Lenny was, but uh, I knew of him. You know, of course, I knew George Carlin and Richard Pryor and mm -hmm. all these great comics. But Lenny was just before them. He was the trailblazer. And uh, I was asked to do the show. This guy, Charlie Brill, said, you remind me of Lenny. Do you know who he was? And I said, well, kind of. And he said, read the script. So I read the script, and I got nervous because Lenny's friends were, like, in their 80s and in L.A., still around. I'm like, I can't do this play. Everyone misses Lenny. All his friends are still alive. Yeah. And I was talked into it, and I did it. And I fell in love with the guy. I realized how important he was and, and just so many parallels with our lives. And, and so what happened was I did the play – for six months, twice. And then I realized I wanted to do a deeper dive because we weren't doing his material. We were just like talking about things as opposed to doing things. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it was just a bit safer than I wanted to tell this story. And so I wrote my own. I spent five years and, you know, as an actor, it's hard because you, you hope to get something this special as opposed to, you know, Mr. You Forgot Your Pickle. You know, that's usually the roles you get when you yeah. look like this guy. So, <laughs> so, you know, it's nice to like, get to do something so important. Well, you, know? you brought up his friends. I was thinking it was fascinating to read about his daughter. You actually got the blessing of Kitty Bruce, mm -hmm. too, with this show. Yes. Did she, she, and she's seen it as well, right? Yeah, it took her a year to see it. Yeah. Because she had to get ready. But I, but I would send her clips of the things that I thought maybe would be, you know, hard for her. And so, but no, she's my sister. I mean, we're so close. And she gave me the best compliment. She said, it's the best betrayal of her father she's ever seen. And so, like, to me, it's like, Oof. I care about reviews, but that's like, after that, what else, you know, I don't really care what anyone else thinks after that, right. you know? Absolutely. So. Well, you talked about, too, the similarities between your life and even the similarities a little bit what we're dealing with today, which I didn't realize until I started kind of diving in a little bit and talking about freedom of speech and things. It's kind of somewhat that's interesting to you as well that I read that you get to talk about on stage. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole point. Lenny was arrested for words in the 60s. I mean... Uh, in 1966, uh, he passed away, but just before that, he was getting arrested for, I mean, there was a, a few uh, dirty words, but really, for the most part, it was more about him challenging. He held the mirror up to society, and I think they blamed it on words, but they, they were scared of him because he was smart, and he, he pushed the envelope, and he crossed the line. They had to make a new line. You know, there's always that guy, and so I think, uh, you know, he, he paved the way, and he basically... Um, you know, I don't want to say died for, uh, you know, it's a little blasphemous, but you know what I'm saying. He really, you know, they, they were just they were just scared of him is the bottom line because he challenged everything, you know. Do you think that this is part of the reason that it's an important story to do now? It's an important stage yeah. to be, you know, to take over the stage and be able to have people in the audience see? Yeah, I mean, First Amendment is still a hot topic. It'll probably always be a hot right. topic, especially here in Florida, <laughs> is my understanding. Uh, I live in L.A., but, I, you know, I watch the news. Uh, so uh, it's, it's always topical, sadly. Um, and so in some ways, of course, we've progressed. And in many ways, we've regressed. And, and I think... You know, case in point, we saw what happened with Will Smith and, mm -hmm. and Chris Rock. Mm -hmm. you, you can't, you can, listen, here's the thing about Lenny. People didn't understand. They thought, oh, this guy, dirty mouth. He was, that wasn't the truth. Lenny believed, he would say, I have a right to say whatever I want. And then my boss has a right to fire me. In other words, there, there are consequences for your words. 
but I could still say them. You can't throw me in jail for saying something that you don't like to hear. You've been doing this, what I read, nine months, over 100 performances off Broadway, then 125 more in Los Angeles, then the pandemic hit. I mean, there's been a lot of shows under your belt, but there's still gotta be some uh, interesting nerves maybe, or excitement every time you well, go to take on the stage for I nine counted minutes. the other day, I'm at 392 performances, and that's a lot of times to do a 90 minute monologue. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's fresh because every night, like, Depends where the audience, where, where, where they're coming from. Some nights it's a full-on comedy. It's always tragic, but some nights it's mm -hmm. really funny. Other nights they're just staring at me like it's like a car accident <laughs> on the side of the road, you know. But but it is scary. And and the day that I stop getting a bit nervous, I probably should put the show away because I care so much about Lenny and his legacy, and uh, and so yeah, so it, it makes me nervous, but but uh, it's a good thing, I think, you know. Well, it's been a good thing that you've been here on the show today. Thank We're so you. glad we got that. to talk with you. And we Thank want to stress you. again, it's all happening at the Strass Center. There's the website phone number so you can get tickets. And again, we're talking about May 21st. Two shows, too, I believe, Two right? shows, yes. There you go, everybody. Thank you again, Ronnie. It was Thank a pleasure you. to talk with you. I appreciate it. And up next, we get to revisit our interview with the Grammy-winning superstar Michael Bublé. We're going to talk with him about his album and his multi-city tour that, yes, may be making a stop in Tampa. Stay right there. We'll be right back.